in songs of praise. There's always joy in the house of the Lord as we worship God in one accord. Amen. Amen. You may now all be seated. Let us now have a word of prayer. Deacon Yoso Kim will lead us in prayer. Lord, thank you for giving us a new year and new hope. May we live for your glory until last day. Lead us to live each day as a worshippers. We cannot live without your mercy. We often fall to live on your word, though we desire to follow you. Please fill us the Holy Spirit to have a strong faith. Use us to joyfully lead unsaved soul to you and let them their abundant fruit. We pray for our, our uh, overcome COVID-19 and the return to normal life in near future. Give us wisdom to share the gospel in all missionary field. We pray for the health and the ministry of all missionaries, and especially our base in Ethiopia, Cambodia, and the Philippines. Protect our country and may be the righteous brethren to be elected according to the will of God. Have mercy on North Korea for their salvation and their freedom. May uh, Emiletus Pastor, Senior Pastor and Pastor Joseph Kim fulfill their leadership completely and give them the power to awake people. May young people grow a lot in AM and let them uh, their dreams cultivate here. Help the deacons appointed today to carry out their duty well. We also pray for those who are suffering from disease and difficulty. Please help them to endure hardship and achieve a spiritual peace. Help us to worship in spirit and truth. Be with us throughout the worship service. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Let us proceed now to the scripture reading. Our scripture today comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 12 through 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 12 through 18. It will be read to us by Deacon De Sun Lim and Deacon Un Kyung Che. Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses, who would put a, put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing by. But their minds were, were made dull. For to this day, the same veil remains from the old covenant is read. It has not been removed, because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And, and we all, all who with unveiled, unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are, are being transformed into His image with ever-increasing glory, which, which comes, comes from, from the Lord. Lord who is the Spirit. Spirit. Amen. Welcome everyone to Awake Ministries, Myeongsung Church English Worship Service. If it's your first time attending, please come forward at the end of our service so that we can greet and get to know you more. Here are the announcements. If you would like to volunteer for prayer and scripture reading, please speak to one of our secretaries. Also, Let's continue to pray for our church and nation, especially for our leadership during this time of pandemic. Also, if you have any prayer requests, AM Family is here to pray for you. You can share it with us by visiting the welcome desk and please indicate 
whether you would like your prayer requests to be privately or publicly shared. Lastly, the monthly staff worship and meeting for January will be held next Sunday. So we encourage all to join, especially if your birthday is in January. And for further details, please speak to Deacon Paul Q. Now it's time for a special praise prepared by Sister G. Yeshi entitled Grace, followed by a choral praise from Soshana Choir entitled I Lift Up Mine Eyes.
hear the sermon entitled, A Mirror Image from Reverend Joseph Kim. Wow, thank you again to our wonderful Tehillah worship team, our beautiful Shoshana choir. Uh, again, just so blessed today, uh, especially to our uh, sister, um, Shimje, who played the flute. You know, my uh, sister plays the flute also, my duna, um, my 동생 같은 duna. But she plays the flute also, so I heard the flute for many years at home. But not as good as that. Uh, but thank you again to all of our volunteers. Um, greetings to all of our Awake Ministries family joining us together here in person, joining us online, all around the world, uh, wherever you may be. Today, many of our uh, church-wide assignments were announced, uh, many various departments. So welcome especially to our newly appointed uh, leaders. Um, if we could have just a moment for you to stand, our uh, 위원장님, Kim Suik Changnorim, will continue for another year. 잠깐, so just you know. And our uh, Im Chang Young, uh, Sangim Bujangim, will be serving us for the new year. And uh, we also have our Yun Poyan Chipsanim, who will be our uh, Yebin Kujan, um, serving us. Uh, so we have some new faces. Of course, our elder is continuing. And many other new faces, uh, if we could give them a round of applause. Um, we have so many different roles here. Um, so to all of you who have served for the last year and are continuing uh, to serve again for your fifth, for your 10th year, some of you uh, 15 years, um, just thank you so much to all of our members who served this past year, uh, but will not continue serving in the next year, unfortunately, for various reasons. Um, we thank you as well for all of your service. Our deep, deep appreciation goes out to all of you, um, especially to our uh, previous Pujangim, Chang Hongshik Chipsanim. Uh, if you could stand for one moment. Uh, He served us for uh, many, many years um, forcefully. He was not volunteered, but voluntold uh, to be our, but he really did an excellent job. So thank you again so much. Uh, you know, I was thinking about this as I was preparing the, um, you know, chart and looking through all the names and, you know, the foundation of any church must be Jesus Christ. That is without any dispute. The foundation must be Jesus Christ because he is the head of the church worldwide. But God also appoints men and women who are anointed to serve as leaders in the church. And not just pastors, but also lay people are anointed by God, chosen by God to lead in the local church. And so these men and women, these leaders, just as a tree would need both water and light, these pastors and lay people work together because one is not enough on its own for this tree to survive. To build a healthy church, pastors and lay people must work together. We need each other. One cannot survive without the other. You know, as a pastor, I haven't served, you know, in 100 churches or even in 50 churches, but I have served here and there. And I think I've served in enough churches. I've seen enough people, enough church members to know that I am blessed, blessed to have truly wonderful people here in Awake Ministries, here at Myungsung Church. And I think truly it's a testament to our church, to Myungsung Church, that it's able to continually nurture new leaders. It trains and develops and even sends out new leaders. That is the sign of a healthy church, a truly healthy church. So truly thank God 
that we are members here of a healthy church. And we pray and we hope that it would all be for the kingdom and the glory of God. All of us here have turned to the Lord. We've turned to Jesus. We've turned to Jesus. And so the veil is taken away, it says. The veil that was over our eyes is taken away. And Paul speaks of the old covenant. That when the people read the words of Moses, the law of the Old Testament, the old covenant, that their hearts were covered by a veil. Not their eyes, but their hearts were covered by a veil. And this veil prevented them from truly seeing God, from truly meeting and encountering God. But in Christ, this veil is removed. It is taken away no longer. And our hearts are opened wide to the presence of God the Father. And all of this is by the Holy Spirit of God, he says, for truly where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. We are free people. Free people. Whether here in a democratic country like South Korea or anywhere else in the world where oppressive government regimes may press on the people, regardless, in Christ we are free. For where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. The veil has been taken away. So what should we do now? Paul says we must contemplate the Lord's glory. Contemplate the Lord's glory. But how do we contemplate? If you look in the dictionary, contemplate just means to think about something deeply to meditate on something, to think about it and consider it for a very long period of time, to contemplate. This isn't like being at work and thinking, what should I order for lunch today? That's not contemplating. It's when we think much more deeply, more profoundly. It has a philosophical meaning. It brings to mind the sculpture by Auguste Rodin, the thinker. We all know the thinker, right? He's deep in thought, thinking, contemplating about something in deep concentration. No one knows what it is. That's why it's art. But he's thinking very deeply about something. Great concentration. Great deep thought. Contemplate the Lord's glory. You think... Does this mean that we should just think about God? Contemplate the Lord's glory. Just think about it. Just go off to the mountaintop somewhere and think about God. See, we read the word contemplate from the NIV, the New International Version, which we use. It's a great translation, but I think it's a little weak here. I think here other translations might actually do a little bit of a better job at explaining what Paul really meant. If we look at the New King James Version, it says there, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. Beholding as in a mirror. And I think this is much closer to the meaning of the original Greek word. Because it didn't mean to just think about God. It meant to look at God's glory as if looking through a mirror to reflect God's glory as in a mirror. You know, recently I saw a very interesting uh, work by an artist named Anthony James. It is called The Great Rom Rombicosi do Decahedron. Rombicosi do Decahedron. Say that five times. The Great Rombicosi do Decahedron. And this was very interesting. You know, it's written down here so you can Google it later, but it's a work of art that you look into. And when you stare inside, it seems that there is another dimension within this small work of art. It stretches on into infinity. It never ends. It is an optical illusion. 
very fascinating. And it is created using metal and mirrors and LED lights. And the artist, he does this by positioning the lights and the mirrors in a certain way so that they reflect onto each other. The light reflects to the mirror, reflects to another mirror, reflects to another mirror, and just keeps on going in a loop. And it continues on forever. And this is only possible because mirrors provide crystal clear detail. If you've ever bought a cheap mirror, you know it's not so great. But the really nice mirrors, you can see everything down to the exact detail. So these mirrors that he uses shows you into infinity these lights being reflected. You can see exactly what is in the mirror. Mirrors are so precise that doctors use them every single day. If you go to the dentist, what do they do? They stick the mirror in your mouth, right? And they see the back of your teeth. And they say you're bleeding because you don't floss enough, right? Doctors in the operating room, when they have an operation, they're performing surgery. The surgeons will use a mirror, even in microsurgeries, to operate on parts of the body that they cannot see with their own eyes. But they'll use a mirror. They'll trust this mirror to show them exactly what they need to do. They will make fine, minute, exact cuts into their patients based on the mirror. And then they make stitches, the exact stitches that they need, again, based on the mirror. The mirror will show them everything that they need to see because they give us a perfect reflection. How many of us today looked in the mirror in the morning while you were shaving and you're saying, did I, did I miss a little hair that I need to get? You know, for the women, if you did your, you know, the, you have to open your mouth, right? You can't do it with your mouth closed. When you're doing this, you're looking in the mirror. When you're doing this, you're looking in the mirror to see exactly what you need to see, down to one hair falling. Because this is how exact our mirrors are today. And we think that this is what a mirror should be, what it has always been. But then we read this verse from Paul and we think, how can I be a mirror? How can I be a mirror of God's glory? How can I be an exact copy, an exact representation of an almighty God? I'm a terrible mirror. Because God is perfect. God is righteous. God is without fault. And yet we are not those things. We are not perfect. But we have to remember that when Paul wrote these words, when this verse was written, that mirrors are not like what they are today. Mirrors were very different back then. They were made out of metal that were beaten into shape and then highly polished to give a reflection. And so this meant that when you looked into a mirror, the image that you saw was not perfect. The image could be a little fuzzy. It could be a little cloudy, depending how well you polished it. The image could be a little warped. It could be a little distorted. Nowadays, we watch TV in 4K. But this was 360p, these mirrors back then. Not even 1080, 360p. It was not a perfect reflection. The colors as well could be off. The color of a mirror, when we look in a mirror, we see the exact color. But these mirrors were made out of bronze. And of course, bronze has a bronze color. So back then, you didn't even need to suntan. Because as soon as you look in the mirror, you're like, oh, beautiful tan, right? You would not see the exact color that you needed to see. These mirrors were also very small. People used them for personal use, just to see their face. You would not see a full-length mirror like we have today. Only the very rich could afford something like that. 
a full length mirror. These mirrors were very small. And in this, we can see that Paul gives us grace when he tells us to reflect God's glory like a mirror. Because as a mirror, as in Paul's day, we can only reflect God's grace in a small and imperfect way. It's not perfect. It's not exact. It's a little off. We can't get every single detail correct. But what matters is that we do reflect God's glory. Even in our small, distorted, blurry mirror, we reflect God's glory, even just a little bit. So when people who are outside the church, or even sometimes from within the church, there is criticism that, oh, Christians are not like God. Christians are not like Jesus. And it's true. If Christians were exactly like Jesus, the world would be better. We're not exact copies. We can't be. They criticize us for not being a perfect reflection of God. But we can find comfort in this fact that we are mirrors. Not perfect, but we are mirrors that reflect God's glory. Because God is perfectly good, but we are not. You and I, we are not perfect. So let us be our confession today. Let us repeat together. I am a mirror. I am a mirror. You are all mirrors. I am a mirror of God's glory. I am a mirror of God's glory. You are all mirrors of God's glory. God is perfect. Repeat, God is perfect. God is perfect. God is good. God is good. I am not. Oh, that was weak. I am not. I am not. We're not perfect. We are not completely good in every single way. But that is not what God expects from us. That is not what Paul is telling us to do. Now, on the other hand, does this mean that because we are imperfect, because we are just mirrors, that we can just do whatever we want? Because, I mean, we'll never be perfect anyway, right? I'm just a mirror. What can I do? There were many people who had this exact same thinking, this mentality in Paul's day. And these were Christians. They were part of this new church. They said, we believe in Jesus but we're not perfect. We're covered by grace. Jesus died for our sins and Jesus is coming back soon anyway. So just do whatever you want. Live a life of pleasure. Live a life of joy. Just find whatever you want to do and do it. It doesn't matter. Nothing matters. They said, eat until you are full. Drink until you are drunk. Be merry and follow your desires. But Paul addresses this line of thinking when he says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? No, by no means. That's not how it works. We are those who have died to sin. So how can we live in that sin any longer? So then what is the balance that we have to find? On the one hand, we are not perfect. On the other hand, we are not supposed to just give ourselves up to sin. So what is the balance that we can find in the middle? In our reading today, Paul says that when we contemplate God's glory, when we reflect God's glory like a mirror, we are being transformed, he says. We are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory. And this glory comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So the Spirit is working within us to transform us, he says, but not all at once. It doesn't just happen with a snap of a finger. No, it's a process that happens over time. So today we might not be a perfect reflection of God. Not today. But by the grace of God, through the work of the Holy Spirit, tomorrow we will look just a little bit more like God. And the day after that, 
hopefully, again, by the grace of God, by the work of the Holy Spirit, will look a little bit more like God, our Father. And so over time, we will resemble God more and more. We will look a little bit more and more like God, moment by moment, day by day. You know, just the other day, I was talking to my daughter on video chat. And, you know, it seems hard to believe. It's, it's weird for me to even say it out loud. But because of the pandemic, I have not seen her in two years now. It's been two years. We're now in the third year of coronavirus. And, you know, those of you who have children, many of you here have children, you know, just one day without your child is the, actually one day is okay. It's like, oh. But, you know, the second day you're like, oh, I want to see them. You start worrying, you start thinking about them. For me, it's been now 700 days, over 700 days since I've seen my daughter. Thankfully, by God's grace, I think I will be able to visit her uh, at the end of this month. But as I was speaking to her, it just struck me in that moment how much she has changed in those two years. I hadn't asked her. I knew she was growing, but I never really asked her. And then I asked her on that call, I said, how tall are you now? And she said, I'm 5'5". 165 centimeters. Taller now even than her mother. I was looking at her and, you know, her voice has changed. Her face has changed. She's not the little child that I remember the last time I saw her. And, you know, of course, her, her mother and I always argue about who she resembles more. You know, all parents know this, right? Who does she resemble more? No, she looks like me. No, she looks like you. You know, all the good things are from me. All the bad things are from me. But thank God she takes after her mother's body. She's very skinny. You know, thank God. If she had my body, it wouldn't be good as a girl, right? But even though she's quite skinny, we were chatting and she was like, oh, I'm sweating so much. Because over there in South America, in the Southern Hemisphere, it's uh, summertime right now. It's the reverse of our seasons. So it's summertime. She's like, oh, I'm so hot. I'm sweating so much. And, you know, when I heard this, I felt great pride, but also great guilt. Because I sweat a lot, right? Especially when I preach, I sweat a lot. I don't know why. You know, don't come to me afterwards. I'm like all sweaty. And so I knew that I gave this to her. I gave her this curse of sweating. But also, I'm happy that she resembles me. That's my daughter. And I said, truly, truly, you are your father's daughter. Right? You know, we all resemble our parents. And as mirrors who reflect God's glory, we're not meant to be perfect copies of him, but we are meant to resemble him, to resemble our father, not our earthly father, but our father in heaven. Just as we look at a child and we say, oh, you have your father's chin, you have your mother's nose, oh, you have your grandfather's ears. We always say this when we look at children, don't we? Do you know any families like this who all share a very distinctive feature. You know, I had a very good friend back in New York uh, from childhood, and I love him very much. I'm not making fun of him, but he has the flattest nose I've ever seen in my life. It's just, it's like this, right? It's like a, like a hotok, just, you know, that's his face. And his children, he has three kids now, they all have the same exact nose. Same exact nose as their father. And no one will ever wonder whose kids are these. One look at the dad and they know uh, these are his children. Surely they belong to him. And so in the same way, when people see us, they should say, ah, I see the resemblance. 
I see your resemblance to the Father. Again, not our Heavenly Fathers, but our Father in Heaven. We should resemble our Father. That is right and natural. Our forgiveness should resemble the Father's forgiveness. That is the kind of forgiveness that Joseph practiced. Our humility should resemble the Father's humility. That is what Moses was known for. Not quite God's patience, but God's humility. He resembled his Father. Our heart should resemble God's heart. That is what David was chosen for. When God saw all the sons of Jesse, all of David's older brothers who had precedence and priority over him, God said, I see your heart and it resembles mine. Our love should resemble the love of the Father. That is what Jesus showed to us. And Jesus is so important, not just because he provided a way for us by his sacrifice, but also because he is the clearest, most perfect example, the the clearest mirror that we can see of God. That's Jesus. Jesus' love resembled his father's love. We must resemble our father. People must look at us and see, ah, I see the traits of the Father in you. But that doesn't mean that we should all look exactly the same even. You know, I read that in ancient Rome, they used to uh, have a tradition of men having beards and long hair. That was the original style. It was actually Julius Caesar, when he came to power, because he preferred to have a clean shaven face and he preferred to cut his hair very short, that is when the style changed. And actually they say that um, Caesar, Julius Caesar was actually quite bald. So as the story goes, he would take the hair from the back of his head and comb it forward like this, okay? Even Julius Caesar. And you know the wreath, the laurel wreath that we always see around Julius Caesar's head, it was to hide his baldness. Whenever we see paintings or statues, sculptures, busts of Julius Caesar, we see him with the wreath because he did not want to be, depic- to be depicted in his baldness. He was trying to hide it from everyone. But what happened is that because he was the emperor, right, he's Caesar, everyone started copying his hairstyle. Everyone shaved off their beards. Everyone started trimming the sides of their hair very short. And I'm assuming some people even started combing their hair forward, just like Julius. And so this became a tradition in Rome, that whatever hairstyle the emperor had, that is what all the men began to follow. So we see Emperor Nero. Uh, Emperor Nero, we should know, was a terrible, terrible persecutor of Christians. But Emperor Nero, as it uh, goes, had very long hair. And not only that, but there were curls, right? He had pamamori, right? Like, you know, so all the men in Rome began copying his hairstyle. All the men in Rome began getting pama because of Emperor Nero. When Hadrian took power, he became the first emperor to grow a full beard. And so all the men began copying him, where once everyone was very clean shaven, now everyone began growing a full beard because they all wanted to copy the emperor exactly. And we think, how ridiculous would that be if that was still the case today? Imagine if to become a member of Myeongsong Church, they say, oh, welcome to our church. Here, come to our new members class. And now it's time for your haircut. I'm going to cut your hair exactly like Tami Muksami. It's crazy. Or imagine today, you have been Im right? Im and you're here in Awake Ministries. Now you have to copy 
Pastor Joseph's hair cut. Right? We'll cut it the size right off. It's very easy, by the way. Five seconds. That's all it takes. But we know that's ridiculous. Not only would it look weird, but, I mean, people will probably call us a cult, right? It's very strange. We would never do something like this. Because in the family of Christ, although we all resemble our Father, that does not mean that we have to all look exactly the same. We do not all have to look exactly alike. But sometimes we make the mistake of thinking that for someone to be a Christian, that they have to act the way that we act. They have to speak the way we think. They have to think the way that we think a Christian should be. We have an idea in our mind of what that perfect Christian is, and that's what we try to do. But then we take that and start putting it on other people and say, no, this is what you need to be. But you know, that doesn't have to be the case. Because if you look in a family, there can be a resemblance even when there is a variance. And just as an example, you might look like your mother. And your brother or your sister also looks like your mother. But that doesn't mean they look exactly like you. There might be a third brother or sister. They might look like the mother as well, but they might not look like any of you. In a family, there is resemblance even when there is variance. And I found that there's even a philosophical theory for this, of family resemblance. I want to talk about this quickly, and then we'll finish. And this theory was made popular by Ludwig uh, Wittgenstein. He was a professor of philosophy at Cambridge University, and his argument was that um, using the example of games that there was a family resemblance, even if there was nothing in common. And so he asked, what is a game? What is a game? All of you have seen Squid Games, right? I've resisted mentioning Squid Games in sermons as much as possible, because if you've watched Squid Games, you know it's very negative on Christians, right? Not not a good perspective on Christians. You know, let's be honest, the Christian guy in that show was weird. It was very weird. But whether it be a squid game or games that you play with your family at home, board games. What about the Olympics that we watch every four years as we cheer on the country? Or the professional sports that people get paid millions of dollars to play, but it's still just a game to the games that children play on the playgrounds every single day, the video games that people play on screens all around the world. Are they all the same? We know that they're all games, right? They're all games. We know that. But how are they the same? And so Wittgenstein argued that It was not just one thing that they had in common, or even a series of things that they all had in common. But that games had overlapping similarities. That some things were similar and some things were not. But you could still consider that a family. That there was still a family resemblance there. So baseball might be similar to Paduk to go because there's no official time limit for the entire game. It goes on until one side wins. And baseball is similar to soccer, to football, chukwu, in that there are two sides on a grass field with one ball. But there is very little similarity between paduk and soccer. And still they are in the same family. They might both have something in common to baseball, but not much in common with each other. But still, they are part of that family, that same family of games. There is a family resemblance between them without requiring that they be exactly alike. 
or even all that similar. And that is what we see in the family of Christ as well, that we are part of this family. We might not all look the same, but we are still part of this family. Even if we don't talk the same or act the same or think the same, we are all connected by our resemblance to God. God is the great connector of our family. Because we resemble God, we can resemble each other in a way. This is our family resemblance. That is how the gospel was able to spread. It didn't just stay in Jerusalem and Judea. Think about it. Who was Jesus? He was just a Jew that no one really knew about. He was from a small area that no one cared about. But still, the gospel spread from Jerusalem to all of Judea, to Samaria, to every corner of the Roman Empire, to parts of Europe and Africa and West Asia. From there, across the ocean to the New World, to North America, South America. And then it came all the way back to Asia, where we are now. That is our lineage, think about it, our heritage of faith, how the gospel has been passed down through the generations across time and space. What do we have in common with these people? All around the world, throughout history. What do we have in common with, you know, a a Portuguese sailor who went to North America? and brought a priest with him to spread the gospel. We have nothing in common with these people. And yet, we are part of that family. We are part of that family. We might have different skin color. We might have different facial features. We might speak different languages. We eat different foods. We wear our clothes. We even sleep differently. But still, we are part of the same family of Christ. We resemble each other because of our resemblance to God. So to conclude, we are a mirror. You are a mirror reflecting God's glory. You might not be able to do it perfectly, exactly the same way. You might be a lot smaller in your glory than God is. Yeah, we know that. But that's not what is expected of you. It's okay not to be perfect. It's okay not to match the glory of God exactly. But still you are a mirror reflecting that glory of God. Every day, through the Holy Spirit, we resemble God a little bit more. Tomorrow, a little bit more. The day after that, a little bit more. And so we are all members in this family of Christ together. And we look alike. We resemble one another. There is a family resemblance that ties us all together. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you that you have called us to be mirrors. That you have called us to be in this family, Lord. We pray, Lord Father God, that we would love our brothers and sisters in Christ. No matter where they might be from. No matter how they might look and differ from us that we would love them, for we have a family resemblance through you, O Lord. Help us, Lord, to truly mirror your glory and grow into this image of Christ day by day, by your Holy Spirit. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
thank you that we are able to worship together, that truly where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, freedom to worship, freedom to give to you with cheerful hearts, because we know that this is what you love. Let us come before you, O Lord, with our newly given assignments. We pray, O Lord, over our entire church, over every single department, O Lord, that they will be used faithfully for your kingdom and your glory. We thank you and we pray together all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Let us conclude our worship today. Uh, before we sing our final song, let us all stand together. Uh, let us turn to our neighbor and greet them by saying, You are a mirror. You are a mirror. All of you are mirrors. And turn to someone else and say, We are family. We are family. Truly, we are family. We are family. Let us sing together. Let us pray now together. We pray, O Lord, that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has brought us into this family together, and the love of the Almighty Father God, whose glory we reflect day by day, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, who gives us freedom, may it be with the members of our Awake Ministries and Myung Sung Church, now and forever. Amen. Amen.